minutes to introduce Dr. Patrick um, Avila. Um, it is my honor to introduce him today. Dr. Avila earned his master's degree in public health at UC Berkeley and then his medical degree at Stanford. He then completed his internal medicine residency at Brigham and Women Hospital, but he soon saw the light and then came back to the West Coast where he completed his GI and advanced endoscopy training at UCSF. We are incredibly fortunate to have Patrick with us, not only for his clinical expertise, but also for his exceptional endoscopy skills, but above all, I think, for his immense care and dedication he showed to his patient. What also stands out about Patrick to me is his commitment to mentoring fellows. I recall that one weekend I was on with Patrick during his paddleberry case, um, and Patrick was so incredibly patient walking me through like an MRCP case over the phone while his adorable son was crying and his dog was walking in the background. Somehow Patrick always reminds me of like the show, like who wants to be a millionaire? And if you run into trouble, you can phone a friend. And Patrick remind me of that friend colleague who's always ready to help. Um, so we are so lucky to have Patrick today to talk about introduction to hepatobiliary. Thank you so much, Mai, for those kind words. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my honor to be here to um, introduce some concepts um, that you'll that'll come up when we're doing pancreatobiliary work or some of the work we do is in interventional endoscopy. Please interrupt me with any questions at any time. Let's see. Um, today, I think last year I went over a lot in one talk and I want to respect um, your cognitive load. So I think today I really just want to focus on um, ERCP and EUS, um, pre and post procedure care, some of the reasons we do these procedures and some of the high level points that you should be aware of as you're starting your, your fellowship. Next week, I'll dive more into uh, common bile duct stones and some um, basics of pancreatitis. So ERCP uh, stands for endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography, and it's basically an, a description of what we do in this procedure. We take an endoscope and we advance it to access the bile ducts and pancreas in a retrograde fashion. And then we use fluoroscopy and x-ray to light up um, the systems of interest. Um, this here uh, on the right is a, is a representative image of what we might see when we're lighting up the pancreatic duct, the bile duct, and the gallbladder. One thing to keep in mind, especially as you're starting some of your consults, is that ERCP really shouldn't be considered a diagnostic procedure. Um, we have outstanding, there's been outstanding developments in our imaging modality, CT, MRCP. Um, and so really most, the vast majority of the time, there are some very rare expectations, but we should be approaching ERCP with a therapeutic intent. And the reason that is, is it's not um, it's one of the highest risk procedures we perform in, in GI. So we want to make sure that anytime we're doing this procedure, we have a thorough understanding of the risks and benefits and that the benefits are going to outweigh the potential risks. What are some of the relative contraindications? So when you're getting a consult for an, e an ERSP might be considered, what are some things you should be thinking about that might make you pause? Patients who cannot tolerate an general anesthesia or MAC. There are some patients who are incredibly sick and in, in the ICU because of ascending cholangitis um, and they're unstable because of the infection. So you have to have that discussion with the ICU team and your anesthesiologist because decompressing their system can um, take an unstable patient and make them stable. Uh, neutropenic patients, if there's an untreated bleeding disorder and uh, luminal obstruction, although that's what's an asterisk, we um, have a lot of experience here with patients who have partial or complete obstructions and can get creative here sometimes, but it's something to always consider in part of our pre-procedure planning. Pregnancy testing should be um, performed for women with childbearing uh, potential, just given the fact that we are using um, x-ray and radiation. Coagulation studies um, and a CBC are helpful in determining bleeding risk. Holding blood thinners if possible, in particular, if sphincterotomy is planned. Um, we'll get into um, blood thinners and bleeding a little bit later in the talk. We'd also like to know what about previous surgeries? What is their anatomy? Is it a standard anatomy? Have things been rerouted so we have to use different scopes and tools uh, to get what we need to go? Have they had previous ERCPs? If so, what were some of the findings? And if their imaging studies 
um, if they've been transferred from an outside hospital and have had imaging studies uh, to be have those up uploaded, they can help us for pre-procedural planning. What about some of the medications that we're often but not always given during ERCP? One uh, big medication is rectal nemethicin. This decreases the risk of post-ERCP pancreatitis. Uh, there was a um, nice New England Journal study, I believe in 2012, if I recall, maybe even um, that showed that there was a very, very uh, good benefit in giving this medication in patients of high risk of post-ERCP pancreatitis, which is our most feared complication as uh, interventional endoscopist. Uh, glucagon, we often give uh, to decrease peristalsis, often on a as-needed basis. Antibiotics really depend on the indication. We'll get into that a little bit as we discuss some of the infectious complications or concerns, considerations with, with, with ERCP. The positioning is different from what you might see for the most part in standard endoscopy. The standard position is going to be left semi-prone, occasionally supine, um, where we have the uh, patient, uh, and it's also known as a swimmer's position, facing us, where we're looking for fluoroscopy and a video monitor across from us with the anesthesiologist at the head of the bed and our um, assistant standing next to us, usually, usually to the right of us. Uh, occasionally, some providers will do a left lateral position, although the challenge with left lateral position is interpreting the, um, the anatomy of the biliary system. That's why either a supine or left semi-prone um, a position or ideal for this procedure. So as I, as I alluded to, we really need to think about some of these uh, special populations and alternate anatomy is a big one. Um, this here uh, on the left of the screen is uh, showing uh, you know, a Whipple, a Whipple, the anatomy of a Whipple patient. Um, often we are asked to interrogate either the pancreatic jejunal anastomosis or the um, biliary, enter biliary enteric anastomosis, and that requires different tools. It's often done with a colonoscope, for example. Some patients who have had, um, you know, ruin wide gastric bypass or who've had uh, hepatic let's say after a liver transplant or after a biliary reconstruction, you'll actually need to use a single balloon enteroscope to navigate yourself to the, to the anastomosis. So these are just, we want the heads up. We don't want to be surprised when we start the procedure and we think a procedure might take, you know, a half an hour for a standard anatomy stone case. But with some of these alternate anatomy patients, we can spend quite a bit of time just getting to where we need to go. So we want to make sure we're aware of this and also be able to counsel the patient on some of the risks and also the likelihood of success as the likelihood of success is slightly lower with these alternate anatomy patients. Although we're asked to do a lot of these here at UCSF. What about pregnant patients? If the, the strong indication basically um, to perform an ERCP, you know, uh, pregnancy is a risk factor for stone formation. And so when we work at the Mission Bay Hospital or, uh, you know, there are pregnant patients who show up and need ERCP. The main thing is, um, you know, if it's indicated, it shouldn't be delayed. If someone has cholodogolithiasis or cholangitis, we need to take that stone out to reduce the risk of worsening complications, both to the, um, to the patient and to the fetus. One thing to remember is uh, while we often give rectal en endomethacin, we really don't give NSAIDs um, given the effect on the ductus arteriosus, um, the fetus, after a 28 week uh, gestation. We minimize our fluoro. You know, there's always random effects of fluoroscopy, although the dose is, is quite low and we do often protect, put a shield um, lower, but we, you know, are thoughtful about our, our, how much radiation we're using as we try to be with every patient. And the position is slightly different. We often will do a left lateral or left pelvic tick, tilt, and this is to avoid IBC aortic uh, compression. But we also, um, also at the Mission Bay Hospital we work at, we'll often see uh, pediatric patients. And so um, essentially it's this, we need to make sure we have a strong indication for these, for these patients. We will see stone disease in, in children. Um, we'll also see, you know, we're a referral center, a cancer center. So sometimes there are big, you know, liver surgeries and have leaks and we have to take care of these patients. Most of the time we're able to use our standard equipment. Um, they, there is a very, very small duodenoscope. Um, unfortunately, the main manufacturers have stopped making this. So it's pretty challenging. And the one we used to have, uh, I think is out, out right now. So it's, it's a bit challenging when they're very, very small. And that does come up maybe once or twice a year. 
So when, we, when you're following a patient that's needed an ERCP and we perform the ERCP and you're going to be taking care of this patient, the questions to ask us um, after the ERCP, um, are we giving fluids? And if so, how much? What about diet after the procedure? Most of us and most patients will put on clear liquids a day of the procedure and advanced tolerated usually the, the, next, the next day, especially if it's a first time ERCP for patients who are coming in for routine stent exchanges without a history of pancreatitis. Many patients advance their diet later in the same day. And we need to discuss um, blood thinners. If they're on any, is it okay to resume them? If not, how long to hold? Is there a role for antibiotics after the procedure? And if we've placed stents, when is the procedure list recommending the repeat procedure or is it a bare metal stent and a permanent stent and it's just an as needed follow-up. So as I mentioned, ERCP is one of the higher risk procedures we perform in GI. And so we need to be mindful and of the potential um, complications and what to be looking out for. Most complications are apparent in the first six hours after the procedure. The most feared complication and the most common is pancreatitis. We also worry about bleeding, uh, infectious complications, and rare, but it can be quite devastating for patients, especially if recognized late, is uh, perforation. So I'll go through each of these complications in more um, detail here. So post ERSP pancreatitis, how do we define it? Well, basically the same way as we do uh, acute pancreatitis, just in the setting of an ERCP. So new or worse than abdominal pain combined with greater than three times the normal value of amylase or lipase more than 24 hours after ERCP, um, or if there's a requirement of hospital admission and uh, prolongation of a planned admission. One thing to note is often teams will check a lipase after uh, the day after an ERCP, even though the patient has zero pain, there was no risk factors for post pancreatitis, and we do see a mild or an elevation, and sometimes even greater than three times, but you have to remember that it has to be in combination with abdominal pain or, or imaging studies that show pancreatitis. Uh, there can be asymptomatic elevation in lipase or amylase uh, without, uh, you know, quite frequently just from being in the area for manipulation in the area. So we really, you know, we, we want to be on the lookout for this, but we should use our clinical suspicion to um, perform workup for this, not just, um, you know, send this routinely on patients after the procedure. What's the pathogenesis? There's a couple thoughts here. One is if you have edema of the pancreatic duct orifice, that's just for mechanical, um, you know, uh, uh, manipulation or potentially a thermal manipulation, edema of the pancreatic duct, then it can obstruct the flow of pancreatic secretions leading to early activation and pancreatitis. There can also be hydrostatic injury from excessive injection into the pancreatic duct. So we're very mindful about injection into the pancreatic duct. What's the incidence? Well, it ranges in the literature from three to about 9%. The number I use when consenting uh, a patient is about 5%. Um, fortunately, the rates of severe post ERCP pancreatitis are quite low and the mortality is quite low. What are some of the risk factors for post ERSP pancreatitis? We, um, it's important to remember that these are additive, so we can divide them into procedural related factors as well as patient related factors. Procedural related factors are difficult biliary cannulation, so more than five attempts, more than five minutes trying to get into the bile duct. Repeated guide wire, guide wire manipulation and cannulation to the main pancreatic duct. Multiple injections of contrast or other fluid into the main pancreatic duct a balloon sphincterplasty, in particular, if there's an intact biliary sphincter meeting, we haven't done a sphincterotomy to help separate the two orifices, and we're just dilating that. Pancreatic sphincterotomy is a high risk, as well as uh, endoscopic snare papillectomy. And this is thought probably from some thermal injury to the pancreatic duct. What about uh, the patient factors? Well, these are some of the risk factors that have been identified in the literature. Younger age, less than 55. Um, female sex, a history of pancreatitis related to ERSP or another etiology, as well as those patients with suspected type 1 or type 2 sphincter body dysfunction. How do we reduce the risk of post-ERSP pancreatitis? The main thing is to perform an ERCP only if it's indicated, to so never allow a patient to have an ERCP if there's no strong role, strong role for the ERCP. Uh, rectal nemethicin, for patients, unless there's a uh, you know contraindication, severe allergy, or low platelets, 
Um, there is some evidence that even in patients with CKD, one dose of rexolimethacin doesn't worsen renal function. We'd like to minimize our contrast injection. The literature suggests wire-guided cannulation, really, rather than um, uh, uh, injection of contrast into the ducts. That being said, we need to be mindful about any approach to cannulation, and often a slight minimal contrast injection can help define the anatomy and easily allow our, our wire to pass. One thing to remember is if, if it's not working, your standard cannulation techniques to get into the bile duct or pancreas aren't working, uh, they need to switch and think about alternative methods. So there's evidence to suggest that well, you know, pre-cut sphincterotomy, where essentially we're freehand cutting the, the sphincter to allow access or performing a fistulotomy is, is a maneuver that requires training and some skill. Uh, evidence shows that switching to that um, can reduce the risk of post-surgical pancreatitis when standard methods are failing. So if it's, you know, so if it's not working, don't just keep trying the same thing a hundred times. Pancreatic duct stenting can be very helpful for high-risk patients. Um, and then post ERCP fluids. There's an asterisk here because a lot of the studies have shown some benefit to uh, post ERCP uh, fluids. The protocols are a bolus followed by high levels for eight hours. And that's just not realistic in the, except with most of our patients actually going home. So it's sort of a tar it's an approach based on risk of the patient and how much you can give. If you're really concerned, you know, it's always better to admit a patient, but we can't really keep them in the PACU for eight hours to give aggressive fluids. Okay, moving on to post ERCP bleeding. Here we see um, uh, a sphincterotomy has been performed, an open bile duct, and on the superior part, we see uh, bleeding in a vessel there. Um, the incidence is about 1% is what I, would, what I typically think of when I'm uh, consenting patients for the risk of this procedure or this complication. What are some of the patient-related factors to post ERCP bleeding? Disorders of hemostasis, quite obvious, if they're on anticoagulants or antiplatelet agents, cirrhosis, uh, end-stage kidney disease or dialysis patients, not to be due to uremic plate and platelet dysfunction. Acute cholangitis is also a risk factor uh, for post-ERCP bleeding. There are procedure-related um, risks as well. Uh, skewed direction of, uh, of your syncterotomy incision, basically not cutting in the direction that you should be cutting. Um, if you're using a conventional electrosurgical generator, there could be something called a zipper cut, essentially where there's an uncontrolled papillary incision. You know, some people will use pure cut currents, um, which has been shown to have slightly increased risk for uh, bleeding after enterotomy. The benefits are thought to be there's less thermal injury. Um, many people use endo cut, which is a combination, and has been shown to reduce the risk of bleeding, but um, you know, it's a bit of a bit of a preference. What can we do to reduce the risk of post ERSP bleeding? Uh, we can optimize coagulation status, really want to keep plates greater than 50,000, uh, INR less than 1.7, adjusting our anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents. We really want to discuss with the referring provider if able to hold. Occasionally, we have had, you know, we have patients who are, uh, it's critical for them to be on anticoagulation. And if we can't hold it because, you know, their brain or heart needs to be on anticoagulation, then we will plan and often just place a stent, not perform a sphincterotomy, or in the rare events where we're asked to perform a sphincterotomy in the situation, we have a discussion about the risks and may take a, a procedural approach to help reduce the risk by placing, for example, a fully covered stent after the sphincterotomy to tamponade any potential bleeding. Aspirin, it's important to know that aspirin is okay for all of these um, procedures. We usually don't disrupt aspirin, it's not a need to. The highest risk bleeding comes after a sphincterotomy and that, that risk is highest in the first 72 hours post-procedure. So we really wanna make sure our teams are, are holding anticoagulation in those 72 hours if they're able to. Um, as you've probably learned about already with some of the um, DOACs, uh, you really wanna make sure uh, you look at their GFR. If their GFR is less than 60, they often need to be held for 72 hours. If they have a normal GFR, it can be held for 48 hours. So just something that kind of in your pre-procedure checklist. The good news about post-DRSP bleeding is that most post-finctorotomy bleeding responds to supportive measures. And if needed, repeat endoscopic therapy. Uh, we can perform if there is a you know big uh, vessel that's bleeding and on the superior side. We can perform thermal therapy. Uh, we can place fully covered stents 
as you see in this um, image here, which helped tamponade um, the vessel, we can inject epinephrine. The one thing that we are always mindful of, um, some people even place clips if you need to, the one thing we're always mindful of is we have to respect the pancreatic duct orifice. So we try to keep our thermal um, current away from the pancreatic duct orifice. If we're placing clips, we really wanna be mindful of delineating our, our anatomy so we're not clipping off the pancreatic duct orifice. Moving on to uh, post ERCP infections. Up to 3% of ERCPs um, have some infectious complication. There's a few mechanisms for this. One is translocation of bacteria from mucosal trauma, or if you really um, are, uh, there is a biliary venous reflux. And if there's an obstruction, for example, and you're injecting contrast above an obstruction, you can lead to elevated biliary pressures and get reflux of a contaminated biliary uh, contents into uh, the venous system. Most often, these are enteric or gram-negative bacteremia, or excuse me, gram-negative bacteria. Duodenoscopes, uh, as you probably are aware of, have been implicated in transmission of multidrug resistant organisms such as CRE. Um, cholangitis happens about 1% to 3% of the time. Cholecystitis is uh, rare. One thing we are mindful of when we're placing stents, particularly fully covered stents, fully covered metal stents, is we try not to occlude the cystic duct. Occluding the cystic duct can then lead to um, um, uh, cholecystitis. You probably, um, there was a lot of press about this uh, maybe 15 or so years ago at UCLA where um, duodenoscopes were implicated in some very serious infections in the, um, at, at UCLA. And the mechanism he, and here is thought to be the elevator, which can serve as sort of a biofilm. The mechanisms of the duodenoscope um, are, are different than a standard uh, EGD scope. So there have been um, basically adjustments in the technology of the scopes to help reduce this risk. You see here a disposable cap on the left. On the right is actually a disposable duodenoscope where when you're done with the procedure, you just throw it in the trash can. The first time I used that, I was pretty shocked and felt really, <laughs> really uncomfortable doing so, but that's what they're, that's what they're made for. How do we do, reduce the risk of post ERCP infections? Um, antibiotics uh, are given based on the indication for the procedure. So obviously if a patient has uh, obstruction and cholangitis, uh, they'll be on antibiotics. If you are, um, if there's a biliary obstruction, unlikely to be successfully drained or completely drained at ERCP. For example, the patients with malignant hyalur obstruction or PSC, which is a diffuse process and not doesn't just affect, affect the larger ducts. Um, you know, there's sluggish contrast flow down through the system. So uh, we always, those patients, we always give antibiotics after the procedure. If you're concerned that there's just, you know, a lot of gunk still in there, you've done some, you place some stents to help uh, alleviate the obstruction, but you're worried about some of the, uh, the sluggish flow, we will give some, we'll give antibiotics after the procedure. Liver transplantation, um, you know, people used to always give it for liver transplant patients. There's some evidence that if, if, if you think drainage is adequate, you don't have to give uh, antibiotics after ERSP and liver transplant patients, but they are on immunosuppression. And so a bit of a lower threshold to give antibiotics after these um, procedures and liver transplant patients. Cholangioscopy or spyglass, this is where we actually use a very cool device to enter the bile ducts and are able to visualize um, inside the bile ducts with, this, with the cholangioscope. In order to do so, we use uh, fluid to sort of uh, open up the system. And so we are infusing fluid. And if there's obstructions upstream or things that aren't being drained, we are increasing that biliary venous re um, uh, uh, reflux. Uh, so we do give antibiotics in this situation. If you've identified that there's um, someone comes in after an ERCP and they have, have cholangitis, you worry about it. Are the stents occluded? You know, biofilms and sludge form in these stents. And so that's why we exchange plastic stents, for example. Um, some of these patients who um, have had a repeat manipulated malignations or biliary system or with high grade obstructions up at the hilum will come in. And, um, and need stent exchanges. So really it's antibiotics and then drainage, improving drainage, whether that's through a repeat ERSP with stent exchange um, or rarely if it's a system that we can't access retrograde, 
um, our colleagues in interventional radiology helping out. Probably one of the most uh, serious, I mean, the most serious complication probably after ERCP perforations, thankfully they, um, they are fairly rare and most of the time recognized if they do happen during the procedure. And most of the time we're able to um, intervene and uh, help and fix the, fix the perforation to avoid a surgery for the patient. About 0.5% of ERCPs, um, there's the staff for classification, which helps us uh, identify where is the uh, perforation and helps us think about the next steps in, in therapy. So type one, is a free duodenal wall perforation. This is often from manipulation of the scope. For example, if there's a slaw, if there's a if there's an obstruction, or sometimes when we're manipulating our scope to take large stones out, the um, bowing of the scope can be enough to um, perforate through a very thin duodenal wall. Type two, which is by far the most common, is basically a retro peritoneal duodenal perforation secondary to periampulary injury. This is often after performing a sphincterotomy, or if we've done a um, a uh, sphincterotomy and a, a balloon balloon dilation, balloon sphincterplasty to help us re, uh, um, help us extract a large stone. We can uh, basically uh, cross that border and have a retroperitoneal uh, perforation. Type three is actually a perforation uh, of the bile duct or the pancreatic duct, and type four is just finding some retroper retroperitoneal air after the procedure without actually any true um, ongoing leak. This is just a diagram to show um, uh, type one is going to be in the duodenal wall. Type two is right at the ampulla. Type three was within the uh, biliary system or the pancreatic duct system. And type four is just seeing some air alone. Essentially, just being mindful of this as a possibility. If a patient wakes up in the PACU or a few hours after the procedure and is having, um, you know, severe pain, especially if they're having any peritoneal signs or signs of, um, you know, sepsis, just get a CT scan. Uh, you know, you want to get the best, the best study. And if you get a CT scan and it's negative, that's great. You know, that's that's good for the patient. It's good. It's good for you. But, um, you know, you want to identify these early. So even if so, don't start with a KUB, you know, that those are not you want the best study to, to, to rule this out. So, um, you know, if someone has you're worried about their renal function, just a quick non con even CT scan will show if there is if there's a bunch of air um, and will help us identify if there's a perforation. If, we, if we're using this class classification, uh, it's very helpful for thinking about management. So if we identify, if we, if there's a free, uh, you know, duodenal wall injury, a full perf, and we recognize it when we're doing the ERCP, we will use a variety of tools, whether it's over the scope clips or standard clips or endoscopic suturing to try to close that perforation. Even if we close the perforation, we will observe the patient very closely. It's always better to have a surgeon on board and not need them than to call them too late. So we'll, we'll get a surgical consultation. Um, in type two, and then, you know, occasionally those are, those are recognized uh, late, too late for endoscopic closure. There's already been leakage and they just need to go to a, a definitive surgical treatment and wash out. Type two, this is what you need to be mindful of. While we want it, if we're concerned about a perforation and it's a, after sphincterotomy, while well, it's always nice to have our um, we want to have our surgeons on board to help us care for the patient. These patients often do not really, um, it's a big surgery in a high risk area to operate and that, and most of the time, vast majority of the time are able to be treated endoscopically with fully covered stent placement to seal off the leak. Um, so we need to be very mindful of, you know, differentiating between type one and type two, um, uh, post ERSP perforations. Type three or four, often if you have a minor bile duct uh, leak, that'll seal off. You might put them on antibiotics. Um, type four, where there's just a little bit of uh, air without a leak, that's thought just to be due to pressure through kind of a, uh, maybe a, um, you know, the thin duodenal wall and some, and some micro perforations that's sealed on its own. If they're doing well, often no interventions needed. So just because you see a little bit of that, you have to, you know, number one is looking at the patient and determining how they're doing. If they're doing fine, there's just a little bit of retroperitoneal air, you can just observe them. Um, this is just showing a photo of a fully covered uh, stent. If they're up for a type two perforation where you help seal off that superior part that may have 
the synchrotomy may have gone a little bit too far, um, and this helps seal and control the leak. Um, this is a type one perforation where you see a hole in the duodenum um, that it was closed with a uh, over the scope clip. So um, I'm going to move on now to endoscopic ultrasound. Um, how's everyone doing? Any questions or concerns that have come up? Maya, have you received any questions in the chat? It looks like I don't think I've received any. We're all good? Okay. Very good. Great. So endoscopic ultrasound um, is a combination of endoscopy and ultrasonography to visualize and sample structures in the pancreas, um, GI tract, posterior mediastinum, and retroperitoneum. Um, you know, this is a very, very cool um, technology and cool procedure. Uh, initially, um, you know, uh, when it was first developed, it was just purely diagnostic. And now we've moved on to actually um, the world of interventional EUS, which has moved our field um, um, in a very, very cool direction. So what some of the equipment, well, we need, you know, our ultrasound processor, we have two different types of echo endoscopes. Um, there's a radial echo endoscope. This has a 360 degree view. It's a purely diagnostic tool. There's no working working channel. Um, this is uh, when uh, EUS was first developed. This is uh, what was mostly performed just to help, for example, stage an esophageal or a gastric cancer, a pancreatic cancer, but no therapy is able to be um, delivered in this uh, with this type of scope. A linear echo endoscope has a 180 degree view and it allows for passages of needles and devices. I will say that most of us do use the linear echo, echo endoscope the vast majority of the time in our procedures as we can do diagnostic work with, uh, with the linear echo endoscope, but also it allows us uh, devices and you know, to be able to pass devices and tools if needed. There are some occasions where using a radial echinoscope, for example, for esophageal cancer staging or gastric cancer staging can be very helpful. It's um, a little, little easier, but I think most of the time we're using linear uh, echoendoscopes. We have a variety of needles that can be both, uh, you know, FNA needles or aspiration of fluid or cells, or actually what you see here on the far right are fine needle biopsy needles, which uh, produce a core biopsy. Tip standard sizes are 19 gauge, 25 gauge, and we, you know, use the um, different size depending on the indication and the location. Sometimes it's harder to get a, if it's a small lesion in the duodenum, it's easier to use a, a smaller needle. Um, but there's a variety of needles with pros and cons and different techniques for taking samples, whether you use a suction or a slow pool or a wet section. Um, these are sort of... Um, uh, at the discretion of the procedural list, as well as sometimes our um, uh, pathologists who are in the room with us will ask for, you know, particular type, prefer a different type of needle to get uh, better um, rapid onsite evaluation. What are some of the contraindications for performing EUS? Uh, essentially very similar to ERCP, if you can't to cannot tolerate anesthesia, if there's an obstruction that won't allow us to pass the echoendoscope to the area we need to go to to evaluate, um, it's not really worth doing the procedure. And um, abnormal coagulation studies if we're doing a biopsy or neutropenic patients. What are some? What are the indications for uh, final aspiration or final biopsy? Well, pancreatic lesions we can access quite easily from the stomach or duodenum. Periintestinal lymph nodes in the upper GI tract. There's gastric wall thickening, esophageal wall thickening, ampulla. Um, we can sample in the lower GI tract for perirectal mass, for example. Um, we can also sample in the mediastinum uh, lymph nodes uh, there as well. Uh, pancreatic cysts, um, which I think you will have a talk on or already had a um, talk on this summer, uh, common um, indication for endoscopic ultrasound will often aspirate the cyst to help us send fluid studies to delineate the type of, of cysts and therefore what kind of surveillance and management needs to happen. What are some of the complications of uh, EUS sampling? It's pretty, it's lower risk than ERCP, generally speaking. Uh, infection, bleeding, um, needle tracking of malignant cells is rare, but something to consider. 
um, and then pancreatitis after sampling the pancreas. This ranges quite a bit in the literature. I will often, I think it might be underreported in just my opinion. So I will often quote a one to 2% chance. Um, we try to avoid going through a normal healthy pancreas being as close as we can to the lesion of interest and trying not to uh, ever stick our needle through the pancreatic duct. There is some thought that potentially providing rectal nemethicin prior to EOS sampling may reduce the risk. Um, there is some, there is ongoing uh, trials looking at this, but uh, we don't have clear evidence for this yet. What about therapeutic EOS? This is a very exciting um, uh, development in, in our field. Um, we're able to do quite a bit with EOS now. We're, uh, we're able to drain pancreatic fluid collections, post-operative fluid collections, when standard ERCP, when we're unable to access the biliary system, we can use EUS to help us uh, access the biliary system and perform drainage. Uh, we can perform gallbladder drainage, uh, as well as the creation of enteral anastomoses all throughout the GI tract. Um, this is uh, just kind of showing a diagram showing a post-Whipple patient who was unable to have a, um, a standard stent place retrograde. So the uh, the, the echo endoscope was passed into the stomach. Um, the a, a 19 gauge needles used to access dilated um, left system here, followed by delivery of a wire. It goes all the way through here into the um, into the intestine, and then we're allowed to uh, pass the obstruction and place new stents. So this is all done internally. Um, and uh, obviously most patients would prefer this to having uh, external drains in place. Um, this is uh, kind of, of showing a patient who has a, some of the steps for EUS gallbladder drainage. There's a dilated gallbladder filled with sludge, um, and you can access, um, oh, I think I lost some of my images here, but you can access the, the gallbladder and place aluminum posing metal stent to now have the gallbladder drain into the duodenum or rarely, rarely the stomach. One procedure um, we do here at UCSF is a um, is uh, endoscopic uh, EOS gastrojejunostomy uh, in patients with uh, malignant uh, luminal obstructions. For example, most commonly, I would say here it's in the setting of pancreatic cancer where there's a blockage. We're able to uh, actually create a bypass, which used to just be done surgically by um, uh, placing a stent under EOS guidance between the stomach and the and the small bowel. Uh, typically, the steps of this procedure are, are we fill up that, we bypass the obstruction with a, usually a nasal biliary catheter or some sort of balloon and instill the um, small intestine with um, water and contrast and sometimes a, a dye. And then we will, under EUS and fluoroscopic um, uh, guidance, uh, use a hot axios or aluminum-posing metal stent that's cautery enhanced to essentially create apposition between the stomach and the small intestine. Um, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, can be a, uh, nice procedure for patients who are, you know, suffering from terrible gastric outlet obstruction and compared to surgery, if it goes well, they're able to, um, sort of progress in advance or die and get out of the hospital quicker. So very exciting. Uh, let's see, I think that might be, uh, oh, this is just showing what it looks like procedurally you filled up this loop of small bowel distal the obstruction, you access it with your axios, deploy the distal flange, and then you see your proximal flange. And what you should see through there is a healthy small bowel. So I think I, that's all I have for today. Um, any questions or concerns? I really just wanted to sort of provide some broad overview about ERCP and EUS. Um, and we'll get into some of the more specific pathologies we treat with these procedures next week.